Welcome to a Date with Darkness podcast, where I will be discussing the impact of hurtful and abusive relationships and how to overcome them so that you can move through your pain and get to the kind of healthy relationships you want, need, and deserve. I'm Dr. Natalie Jones. I'm a licensed psychotherapist based in California. While I hope that you find this podcast educational and informational, please note it should not be substituted for treatment with a licensed mental health professional. Also, due to the nature of the podcast, some of the information presented on the show can be sensitive to some of my listeners. So please note that listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Uh, for tuning in for another installment of a Date with Darkness podcast. Um, I am excited to have you here. And I definitely want to get right to it today, see how you guys are doing, do a quick check-in. Hopefully you're feeling pretty good and this week is going well for you. Um, You know, the world is a very interesting place um, today as always. Um, You know, and I have, I'm just going to get right to it today. Um, I have a very special guest for today's show. Again, I'm biased. I think they're all great and special and wonderful. Um, You know, I can't tell you, um, you know, how much it, it moves me that people are taking the time out of their day, out of their schedules to Um, provide uh, the information uh, to you guys to heal and recover uh, from your relationships to help to help you heal and recover from relationships and um, you know relationships um, can be wonderful but um, they can also cause a lot of trauma and um, part of Part of going through trauma, um, which I don't feel like we as a society talk about enough, is depression. And um, specifically, what my guest is on here today to talk about, Dr. Margaret Rutherford, she's on here talking about hidden depression. Um, We I've also heard it referred to as high functioning depression. And that depression um, is something where people, I think, uh, for me, is is how I've come to understand it as a clinician, where people are very good at sort of masking their depression um, in order to do what it is you need to do. So whether it is that you need to be a mom, a father, you need to get up and you need to go to work every day, or you you have to go to school, or you have other sort of obligations, you you kind of put you check your emotions. Um, you put them in the back, you put them up on a shelf, you're very, you become very good at sort of compartmentalizing it and hiding it from the world um, so that you can continue and do the things that you have to do. And this is something that is especially important um, if you are in a relationship or in relationships that are abusive and toxic um, and that you kind of, again, you compartmentalize and you do what you have to do in an effort to survive your relationship. And so, although on the outside, when you go out and you face your colleagues at work, you face your peers at school, you face, um, you know, just ordinary people, and it could be your friends or family, you appear to be okay. Um, but inside you are struggling and it is very serious um, and it affects a lot of people um, where as you know you might hear people talk about all the time that um, someone may have battled with depression or they may have battled um, with even sort of suicidal thoughts and you you might hear people in their lives say I never knew that they didn't appear is so there was anything wrong or even people that may struggle with abusive relationships and you know outsiders looking in may have seen, may have said you know they seem to be fine they came to work every day there was no issue so if you are one of the people that fall into this category uh, where outside you put on you you put on a face to or a mask rather to face the world and you know the mask looks perfectly fine you look perfectly like you are very high functioning and that you can do 
everything, but inside you are struggling internally um, and you don't feel good, you feel sad, you may want to isolate, you're just kind of going through the motions and you don't experience joy. Um, and this, this episode is for you. Um, or if your symptoms appear to be anxious, right? You appear to be anxious about everything, overthinking everything. Um, anxiety can actually be an extension of the depression. Um, so if you're hypervigilant or you're struggling, um, some of those symptoms can actually be a sign of depression and we're gonna get into it here. Um, so if this is you, this episode is for you, um, you know, and I hope that, you know, it resonates with you. And I, I found um, Dr. Margaret Rutherford, a lot of what she had to say, very useful. Um, and, you know, she also gives a lot of um, informative tips on how you can, um, you know, address this and how you can work on this and why it's important um, to call it what it is, which is depression. High functioning make it, makes it sound as though it's better or like you can manage it um, because we put that that word on it that because you're kind of going through the motions and doing the things that you need to do that you're fine when you hear the words high functioning it's like oh okay you're managing you can do this and yes while you may be managing today um, this does have an impact and it does lead to things that are much more serious later on and and uh, my guest gets right into that and so this episode is for those of you um who may have struggled with this. Hello and welcome to the show, Dr. Margaret. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm doing fine. I'm doing <laughs> fine. It's hot as the Dickens here in Arkansas, but other than that, you know, I'm, I've got great air conditioning, thank goodness, and so I'm doing great. It's wonderful to be here. Yes, it's wonderful to have you on, and it's also very hot here in California, in Northern California. We're reaching temperatures above 100 so I, I know, right? And it's so, I feel like it's so early in the year, but maybe not. Um, so I certainly sympathize with the hot weather. I'm not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> so for, and I'm excited to have you on. So for people that don't know who you are, can you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and the passion behind your work? I, I would love to. I have been a clinical psychologist for almost 30 years, so that's a long time, and I've been practicing here in Arkansas. I got my training in Dallas at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School, and um, I started blogging back 10 years or so ago when my only son left home, and then I started podcasting in 2016, and I have the Self Work Podcast, which is um, everywhere you find podcasts, and I've absolutely loved doing it. Uh, it's really, um, I gosh, I'm just like you, I'm sure I'm here from people from all over the world. And yeah. it's, uh, it's fascinating to try to extend the walls of my practice that way. But I also, back about eight years ago now, wrote a blog post called The Perfectly Hidden Depressed Person, Are You One? Mm. And I just kind of picked that term out of the out of the air because I was thinking about the people that I had worked with over the years that when they walked in my door would have vehemently denied that they were depressed. Um, they might be a little anxious. They might uh, say, you know, my husband and I argue because I'm pretty controlling or they might say, I'm not sure why I'm here, but something seems wrong. Um, and yet, after working with them for a few sessions and gaining their trust, they begin to let down some of that armor that they're wearing and that camouflage of this perfect seeming life. And sure enough, there can be a history of trauma or loss or family dysfunction or uh, pressure issues from their childhood that really has caused them to at first probably consciously build this I'll use the term camouflage again mm. for what is painful underneath but they now it's it's they have done it for so long that it's become an unconscious process and they they have lost the ability to really express their um, painful emotions if they ever had it um, these are people who 
they may talk to you about, you know, I'm really sad about this, but then you say, well, where do you feel that? Or they'll kind of look at you quizzically and go, what do you mean? We're not feeling, I'm just, I'm just sad. They can talk about it, but they can't feel it. Hmm. You know, as you're talking about it, it kind of reminds me of what is now called high functioning depression. You hear people say high functioning depression or high functioning anxiety, which means it doesn't look like your typical depression. Yes, you're not completely uh, governed by it. And and I know that people who hear about perfectly hidden depression go, oh yeah, that's me. The distinction in my mind between high functioning depression, it's not that some of the stuff in my book wouldn't help those people, sure. it probably would, but they know they're depressed. <laughs> They may have already been diagnosed with depression. They they may fit quote unquote fit the criteria uh, in in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, they may be on medication. They may be in therapy. They may be going swimming every morning just so they you know because they understand that that helps them with their fortitude and their resilience. But they know that they're high functioning. They know that when I get in the shower, I start crying or whatever. The people that I'm really most interested, well, not most, uh, I think the book speaks to a group that, and the concept speaks to a group that truly they don't know they're depressed. They don't know. In fact, you know, when we think about it in our profession, a lot of the times perfectionism has been considered an anxiety Mm -hmm. problem. Uh, that, you know, you live in the future and you're trying to, you're trying to make sure bad things don't happen or you don't make mistakes or whatever, because that brings you anxiety. What has been missed, I think, is that it's really another presentation of depression, but one that does not fall within the criteria of the DSM-5. If, if I got out my criteria, uh, in the Bible of the DSM and, and was taught, no, 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 I've got lots of energy. No, 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 I'm not depressed. No, I sleep well. No, I've got a fine appetite. Oh gosh, my mind works, clicks along, you know, none of that would apply. And so I think when we, when we, we clinicians, I'm one of them, uh, we can easily make the mistake of passing this over as something that's more about anxiety. And in fact, I opened the book with a story of how tragically I, I had diagnosed someone years ago with anxiety and it just so happened that her husband couldn't reach her. He was out of town and she had left kind of a strange message on his answering well both both back when we had answering machines sure oh yeah uh, yeah don't you remember those and pagers <laughs> and all that simpler um, times it was <laughs> and he asked me and this is a very unusual request and I've never done it since nor been asked since but he said you know where we live do you mind going by and checking on her and I was off that day and something in my gut said I needed to go and he told me the garage code and I felt like a burglar. I mean, it was terrible, but sure enough, her house was just eerily quiet. Everything looked perfect at the house, but I went back to what I thought was the master bedroom and she had polished off a, a bottle of vodka and there was her pill box was empty. Her pill container was empty and um, mm. I probably another hour she would have been dead. And I can remember when they left, the ambulance came and they left I just walked around her house for a few minutes and thought, I've got to pay it. I, I didn't think she was suicidal. Um, n- not in my, n- never had crossed my mind. So I want to reach those people who are struggling with that or who can get there, who are being missed. I appreciate that. And thank you for being so candid and sharing your clinical experience. That's a oh. side of, of being a clinician that, um, you know, a lot of people don't have that awareness of, of, of how we go through, you know, when our patients experience pain or, you know, something unpredictable happens. And it's just like, yeah, that definitely can change the trajectory of our career. It definitely shakes you to your core. um, But it also makes you much more of a heightened awareness have much more of a heightened awareness. One of the the things that came to my mind as you're talking about the hidden depression, um, 
it's it's you were talking about the difference between people having the the typical symptoms of high functioning depression and knowing that they have depression my question about the hidden aspects of depression is it that people are perhaps maybe aware but they're in denial Oh, yes. Um, and so maybe it's not that they don't know, but they're just in denial or refusal to admit that they have. Well, I, I, there's another aspect of that. That's a great question, yeah. by the way. Um, and I really think that what the, the alarm that went off in my head when you said that was they are in denial about the impact of whatever they went Correct. through. Uh, let's say I've, I've had um, uh, African-American clients who've said my seeming perfect is what got me through my childhood. You know, I wouldn't have gotten the opportunities. I, if I had, if I had made mistakes, if I'd let my mistakes show, you know, I was the last one on the list. I had to jump to the, to the top of the list for, yeah. in some way. Uh, there was also pressure that one woman talked to me about, about the, being the first, the first in her family to finish college, the first in her family to do this, that, and the other. Yeah. And so she couldn't let any of her fears or whatever, like the, the show, but there are other, there are other things. Uh, you could grow up in a family where uh, emotions, uh, painful emotions were simply disallowed. Yeah. You could have grown up in a family where there was abuse and you were told you know, we keep secrets in this family. And yeah. And yeah. So there are all kinds of ways, as we say in Arkansas, there are lots of ways around the barn, but um, the, there are, there's several birthplaces of this. It's not just one fits all, mm. but I think it's so important to realize that the denial is, is, I, I think it's sort of an well, not an ignorance, but the denial takes place years and years and years before when what it, whatever is forming in them that causes them to think I've got to look this way in order to to please or in yeah. order to be safe or in order to be, have achievement, um, that that's what gets um, discounted. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, it, it might even be more of a strength based thing. It could be like you said, like a cultural element, like yes. I can't present myself to be this way, or this is the only way I know how to survive, or this right. might be the way that it's kind of keeping me going, or just, you know, even just the stigma around saying sure. that you have a mental health illness. A lot of people don't want to do that because that that I don't know, like that's seen as a bad thing or it's seen as being defective in some people sometimes. So I, I just wonder about how much that also plays a part in sort of the admitting that, wow, yes, I'm really depressed. And it's a, times are a lot different now than they were back when you had yes. your patient. Yes. Um, you know, it's funny you ask that question because one of, I have like 60 reflections exercises whatever you want to call them in the book really should be called a workbook but it's yeah. not um and one of them is when i say the word mental illness be honest and what is the image that immediately comes to your mind you know is it the person you know is it me because i have panic disorder and i've mm -hmm. had anorexia and i have i've certainly had my share of mental illnesses mm -hmm. and still am dealing with panic um, performance anxiety, mm -hmm. really, exactly. So mm -hmm. I've, 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 I'm doing much better with that one, but, um, no, probably people don't think of someone like me. They think of someone as talking to themselves on the street and homeless, or they think of an alcoholic, or they think of someone with schizophrenia, or they think about somebody with a severe bipolar disorder or PTSD or something like that but they don't think about that it can wear many, many different faces. And so that, and that stigma, as you point out, of this uh, picture we have of someone who's mentally ill uh, can really um, cause someone to steer clear of that. Yeah, yeah. And when you said the word mental illness, and I don't know if you've experienced this, but I've experienced this in terms of, um, the different types of folks that I work with, when you say mental illness or you say 
even an aspect of mental illness, for example, depression or anxiety. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people that I have worked with have a knee jerk reaction because the first thing they think is medication and you're going to try to force me to take something, right? You're going to put me in a box and try to force me to take something. And I don't want to do that. Right on target. You betcha. Uh, I have uh, in my seminars where I teach about this, there was a young woman who uh, left me a voicemail and I was so, and I actually use it in my seminars with her permission. She doesn't tell who she is, Sure. Uh, but she says that when she recognized that she identified with perfectly hidden depression, uh, that she went to her therapist and who she loved and trusted a lot. She'd been working with her quite a while. And she said, this, this is me. And the woman looked, she said, no, you don't fit criteria for depression. And it, and this is what made me think about this. She says, and if you were depressed, you would have to take medication. Mm. And i just shake my head, but <laughs> no, <laughs> you do not have to take medication. <laughs> Sometimes medication can be very helpful. I've taken a couple of antidepressants during my lifetime when things got rough. Um, but it's something that, you know, those, those two do not go along like, you know, mm-hmm. salt and pepper. They just don't. Mm-hmm. Or they can too. And it, oh, it's, yeah, it's, that's, that's I an mean, option. Yeah, I think it's definitely an option, but I think it's just more about, you know, building up the trust with somebody and really exploring whether or not that's right for you. And I know a lot culturally, a lot of people are just very resistant, regardless of whether they need it or not. They just don't like the idea of having to take something, Uh, take a prescribed something. Uh, There's a lot of people that would rather take (laughs) recreational some things. (laughs) to kind of do that but yeah (laughs) well that seems like more like you're in control of it you know I know the kind of beer I'm gonna buy or what kind of weed I'm gonna you know use rather than someone hands me and says oh this is the medication that you know that sense of agency maybe that you have to lose some of that and uh, plus there there's some side effects of many of them and um but again, there were, there were been two times in my life when I needed them and because my brain wasn't working very well. Yeah. And so that was very helpful. Yeah. And I think it's helpful for you to even say that because I think by you, just you saying that the people uh, that lets people know mm-hmm. that it's not a, it's not a permanent stamp. It doesn't have to be a permanent mm-hmm. stamp on your foot. It doesn't have to be something that you're addicted to and that once you take it, you'll never stop. And, you know, so I can appreciate you saying that, you know, I don't know about you, but when I started Mm -hmm. blogging and then of course, podcasting, I had to make a decision about self-revelation. Um, and I had already made it, um, in my practice, I, I would, when I thought it was really going to be helpful and probably a trust builder, uh, I would reveal that I've been divorced or I'd be, I'd re- twice in fact. Uh, and I'd reveal I had anorexia or, or panic or whatever, but putting it out on the internet, <laughs> that was another decision. And I did have this bit of anxiety that I would get the, the feedback, well, what are you doing writing on the internet about mental mm-hmm. health if you, mm-hmm. you know, struggled yourself or that mm-hmm. sometimes you still have panic attacks occasionally or whatever. And yet I thought, well, uh, i tell you who I, I learned this lesson from, and it was Maya Angelou, Angelou, I'm sure mm-hmm. you're saying that, Angelou. And um, I heard her speak at um, Bill Clinton's uh, inauguration mm-hmm. and I was so impressed that I went to the bookstore and I said I want to read one of her books but I'd also was just out of graduate school mm-hmm. and I didn't want to read a thick book so I found the thinnest book she'd ever written the tro- woes of grad school I totally get it <laughs> <laughs> called wouldn't take nothing for my journey now mm. and in that so I read it in 1993 or four probably um probably 93, the year I opened my practice and here in Arkansas. And um, in it, she, she has, it's a collection of essays. And Mm -hmm. one of the essays is about one week when she was voted like New York's person of the week or something. 
And she went with some friends of hers to a local pub and she got smashed. I mean, absolutely smashed. And she wow. found herself sitting in this table of gentlemen um, or men crying to them and sobbing and complaining that why didn't men found, find her attractive and all this mm-hmm. stuff. And she says, and I'm, I'm going to crucify what she said, but it's basically, it's the, it's the time in your life when you wish you could change your last name and move to Canada. You know, I mean, she was very well known. And I, I put that story down and I thought, this is the kind of person I want to be. Here she is, former poet laureate of the United States, and she can tell this story on herself mm. with no, I mean, and admit shame, but not stay in the shame. Mm. And to me, it really, it has got that, that story and that book has guided myself personally and my practice. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. I love sure. that. And she, that book is wonder. All of her books are wonderful. Um, I need to read, I need, I need to read another one. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I know why the cage bird sings will never, ever. um, There's just some books that are like classic and never get old. And I can read them a thousand times over. And that's one of them. When you talk about hidden depression, Mm -hmm. in your opinion, do you feel like that's situational? Can you be a little more specific? Yeah. So I work a lot with people that are in abusive relationships, they're healing, Mm -hmm. they're recovering, or they're currently in, and they're trying to get out, right? right? And when you're with an abusive partner, of course, that takes a toll on you emotionally. Yeah, been there. (laughs) So with that being said, there's a lot of people that feel like, hey, I'm depressed because I'm going through this situation with this person. Oh, I see. What you're and when saying. I get out of this sort of funk, whether it be an oppressive partner, whether it be an oppressive job, I'll be okay. Yes. Uh, you know, I'm, sh- I'm sure you're well acquainted with the term trauma bond. And I think that that kind of, uh, kind of sense of losing your, your um, grasp on your own identity and developing emotions and behaviors Mm -hmm. that are really drastic and dramatic and um and speak to your desperation of trying to either make something work that was a bad choice in the first place or uh you know you may have children you may there are all kinds of reasons why it's a struggle to grab or somehow pull yourself back together and Mm. and get out of a of a narcissistic or a trauma bond as far as it fitting with perfectly hidden depression i think that um you and i spoke about this before we actually started recording a little bit that one of the things that I, I didn't write too much about this in the book, but I certainly, it's not, it's, it's, it's not hard for me to consider this at all, that really someone with this type of need to seem perfect, need to be overly responsible, need to be always the one who's saying, I'll get it done, I'll get it done, is someone who would be pretty likely to Uh, be attracted to someone who is a, you know, as I've said to people, uh, good givers attract good takers. Mm. And so, you know, someone could be all swept up by the narcissist and, and then find themselves in a relationship where they are doing all the work and they are being taken for granted and they, they, they are, and they work very hard. And so it, I do think that that part of it could be situational. It could exacerbate yeah. big graduate school word, um, whatever the dynamic is already that's already been established. Yes. Um, and instead of someone uh, having choosing a spouse who would look at her or him and say, you know, we've been together for 12 years and I've never seen you upset about any, I've never seen you cry. Mm. I've never seen you say you're tired, you know, and I want to know you that that's the lucky person. Um, 
who gets uh, a partner like that. But, uh, and so often at this point, I've received emails from people who said, I think my partner would qualify, quote unquote, for perfectly hidden depression. They meet the traits. Uh, they, you know, there are certainly a lot of them that they, um, that seem to describe them well. And, and so what do I do? And, and my answer is simply uh, approach carefully because they are going to be in uh, denial about this. Um, and, it, and it's kind of like anorexia. Perfectionism is something that is your best friend. You, you don't see it as a problem. Mm. That's one of the, the mm -hmm. sticky wickets of this whole thing is mm -hmm. that, you know, oh, I'm perfectionistic and I'm proud of it. You know, it, it, and there is a constructive perfectionism, but it, when it's fueled by shame and fear, that's when it's a problem. There's, you know, I consider myself a perfectionist and, um, I, I don't, but it's, it's not been necessarily some, there are times in my life it's been, been fueled by shame, but most of the time it's been fueled just by feeling creative or feeling, you know, that I wanted, you know, just motivated and determined. Yeah. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But, but if I'm trying to prove that these shameful voices in my head that are talking to me about if anyone really knew me, I'd be rejected or that I'm really not safe uh, if I make a mistake or I'm seen as having made a mistake, um, all of that is frantic and, um, and, and yet you can't look frantic. So it's a kind of frenetic activity that stays this very limited, you know, um, pushed down compartmentalized, uh, fear that, um, these folks have talked to me about. Wow. A thought I wondered about is, in your experience, where do you think the origin, like what's the origin of perfectly hidden depression? Are there certain, um, as they like to say, risk factors? Well, I think we talked about it a few minutes ago as I was, my colloquialism is there are lots of ways around the barn. Um, I do think that it could be family dysfunction and family abuse, uh, sibling abuse, any kind of sexual abuse. It could be neglect. Let's say you were uh, the pseudo adult child. You, you had alcoholic parents and you mm -hmm. had to take care of your siblings. So you didn't, you grew up way too quickly. And y y your idea of a well-lived life is a highly, highly responsible life and one in which you do not admit or reveal any kinds of problems yourself. Mm. Uh, it could be from enmeshment <laughs> when you mm. have a parent that has needs and they pull you into that relationship and make you feel as if you're the only one that can make them happy. And so you become, well, I must seem perfect to them and I must be very achievement oriented and do what they need me to do. And you lose your own sense of identity and what your value is about. And you certainly can't, um, complain because you have this extremely special loving parent again it can be that you grow up in a family where or a culture or a culture where you know you're supposed to count your blessings and mm -hmm. go to church and and not not air your dirty laundry in public in fact don't ever say you even have dirty laundry um and and so that is something that uh, there's certain cultures certain that that almost prohibit uh, in certain religions that will prohibit the expression of something being hard. How many people have you had in your practice? I know I've had a lot in mind saying, I, I went to my pastor because I thought, you know, I'm not being a good enough Christian or Catholic or Jew or whatever, you know, your religion is because I'm, I need to pray more. And, and yet I feel this way. And so that sense of I'm failing, if I'm admitting or revealing struggle. Um, so there can be a lot of things, you know, in certain cultures, just being male in certain regions of the country and the world, just by being male, uh, you're not supposed to uh, have those kinds of expressions. Um, mm. So there, there, there are a lot of ways, but I don't think that diffuses the, the, um, the power of this concept simply because there are a lot of ways to get there. In fact, if anything, I think it multiplies it. Absolutely. Because it, that's not something 
they are so diverse that you can say, but, you know, I don't look like that person. So I must not have, you know, I must not qualify for this. Again, I want to make sure people are hearing me. I didn't come up with a new diagnosis. Okay. <laughs> I'm not narcissistic enough to believe that at all. This is a syndrome to yeah. me, the way I've thought of it. And, and so it, it, there are 10 traits that I identify in the book that are, that make up this syndrome. And a syndrome is simply a, a group of behaviors or beliefs that you find together. You often mm -hmm. find together. There's a, a couple, well, first of all, what do you think is the long-term impact of perfectly hidden depression? Suicide. Really? That's the, that's the worst one. All the, um, there's so much academic research that points to this idea that there are certain kinds of perfectionism that are significantly correlated with suicidal ideation and suicide. The worst one being something called socially prescribed perfectionism. And what that means is you have self-oriented, meaning I expect perfection for myself, other oriented, you expect perfection from others, but socially prescribed is if you have an expectation of me, I must meet it or exceed it. But the problem with it is that that's all expectations. You know, expectations from your children, expectations from your school, expectations from your boss, expectations sure. from your spouse, expectations from your family of origin. There cannot be a request of you or an expectation that you don't feel like you need to, to well, I'm, I'm being absolute here, but that you don't need to, to meet. And Gordon Flett, who has done, a Canadian who's done wonderful research on this, says it's like being on a treadmill where you don't have any control over the incline or the speed. And the better you do, the better you're expected to do. How many times, let me just give you all an example. How many times have you known somebody in your community that let's say they raised $10,000 for a local nonprofit or a hundred thousand, they were the chair of the committee or whatever. And what's the first thing people say to them? They don't go, good job. I hope you get some rest. They'll say, good job. We can't wait for you to do this next year because we'll make even more money. Promise me you'll do it next year. There's the treadmill. Mm. that rather than, I mean, if, 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 if that's someone who identifies with perfectly hidden depression, they'll go, sure, I'll do it next year. Not realizing that they, they're exhausted. And, you know, it, it, it is something it, it's the difference between constructive and destructive perfectionism is destructive perfectionism is all about achievement. Mm. I must achieve the next task. I, then I just go on and I go on and I go on. Whereas you are more interested in constructive perfectionism in the process. How do I get there? Do I enjoy it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did I enjoy working on this committee to raise money for this nonprofit? Did it, was it fulfilling? Um, can I handle it if I didn't make the, the amount that we were hoping to make? You know, what does that say about me? Um, all those things, a constructive perfectionist can go, well, we just need to try harder next time, or we need to adjust this, or there's a sense of give and flexibility. Whereas people with destructive perfectionism, you know, if they didn't make it, they, they are an abject failure. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting, but I can't say that I'm not surprised and I wonder if part of that happens, that, that sort of buildup that you're talking about in terms of worst case scenario, um, because they don't necessarily reach out or they don't allow people in to know the no. severity of it. I had a woman who um, reached out to me about her husband having died by suicide and he was extremely successful. Mm. But she told me this story and well loved and respected and caring. Um, but he had had an early career, mm, to call it a collapse is probably a little dramatic, but 
he had made a decision, a financial decision that ended up, he was manipulated and, um, and, and every, you know, the family suffered. And so he never made any kind of mistake like that again. And she said what struck her when she was trying to find the reason why he got to, to a place where he took his own life. She said there was something beginning to happen that he felt like was a sign that he was being taken advantage of again. And she thinks that what that opened in him was these feelings that he'd never dealt with before. Yeah. In actuality, it did not happen. He was not, but he misread the information and misinterpreted the information because of these highly compartmentalized feelings that he'd never dealt with. As you're talking, you know, the one, one thought that came to my mind is, do you feel like this looks differently, looks different in men as opposed to women? I've been asked that before. Um, I, you know, I'm not a researcher. I'm a clinician. Yeah. So um, the best way I can answer that is just from some of my own experience. And when I was, you know, I wrote that post really not, not, not really knowing the import. I mean, it, it went viral and I was flabbergasted. I thought, what is this? I mean, you know, um, and so what I started doing is I was in the next few months as I was saying, well, what is this? And I read about what Renee Brown had been writing and, and all this kind of thing. And I mm -hmm. thought, you know, I've got to figure this out. So what I did at the end of all my posts, I would say, if you identify with this, would you please consider reaching out to me? Well, I had about in about a three or four month period of time, I had about 80 or 90 people reach out from all over the world. And um, I chose 60 of them and to interview. And I did an hour and a half to two hour long interviews with all of them. And I will say to you that about probably um, it wasn't half and half men and women. There was probably about 60% were women and 40% were men. But I was pretty struck by that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and these were, I mean, one man was a brain surgeon. One woman was a mm -hmm. advertising exec out in California who was in charge of these nationwide campaigns. One was a, a motivational speaker. Uh, one was a, a dentist. Um, and it, it just, I was so struck. And then I also have had mothers and fathers reach out to me whose perfect looking children uh, kill themselves. And you see that now in the sports world, in college mm -hmm. sports, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who are dying by suicide. The, mm -hmm. A wonderful book about that is What Made Maddie Run by Kate Fagan. And it's about a woman who took her own life, a young woman who was a track star at um, Penn State. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a growing problem. Yeah. And I am, I, that's why I appreciate so much shows like this and being asked to be on them because uh, it is so easy to hide in our society. Yes. That um, I'm trying to sound the alarm bell that the, the both for our profession uh, and for the people who might identify with this because um, I have used this as an example. Sorry, you can tell I'm passionate about this. I yeah, no, I love on. it. I'm passionate about it too. <laughs> you know, so the, I love someone the, the, who's equally passionate. I love it. <laughs> the cardiology community years ago would turn women away who were complaining of having symptoms that might, they felt like might predict a heart attack. And, but because the doctors were using uh, research based on men, you know, the, there were only men that were being um, studied. Yeah. Then they'd say, oh, you're not about to have a heart attack. You don't have this, this, and this. Well, it turns out when they started studying women, that women sometimes had the same symptoms, but they could also have different symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so the whole rubric changed. The way a cardiologist began listening to women was different. I'm asking our profession to do the same thing. 
Yeah. I'm saying instead of it's, getting out your DSM five and saying, no, you have to meet these criteria, mm -hmm. then to open your eyes to the idea that, you know, the, the question should not be necessarily alone. Do you feel helpless? The question should be, or could be also, if you felt hopeless, would you tell anyone? And the answer would be no. No, I probably wouldn't ever tell. Yeah. And I, I probably don't ever feel hopeless anyway, but I certainly wouldn't tell anybody. And that's your window. Yeah. That's your window into what is really causing this person to have this purpose yeah. in your life and be sitting, sitting in your office. I would agree. And, you know, and I appreciate you saying that because it does look different. And now there's all this research that shows that basically depression and heart issues go hand in hand. Yes. So right. if you have cardiac issues, one of the number one signs is depression and vice mm -hmm. versa. And not saying that all people will have both, but it's, there is a comorbidity, mm -hmm. a high mm -hmm. comorbidity rate. And I also mm -hmm. think just I, I wouldn't classify myself as a researcher either, but I, I have read a lot of research. Um, and I do think uh, from what the research says, men experience much more abuse as boys and young infants and as children, they experience it at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. And so um, I also wonder if they also experience this at a higher rate. However, just the way that the internalization process works along with the um, societal stigma mm -hmm. that really keeps them from reaching out or really just, they, they've a, a adjusted and adapted and they've kind of masked it with the masculinity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know the yeah. answer to that question. I've certainly had men come to me who have read my work. Sure. And, uh, and I've had women. So um, sadly, I think it's a pretty wide, um, widely experienced phenomenon. And yes. Um, and even in, um, there's a book, there was a book that came out in 2017 or 18, written by these great researchers that I've been talking about. And they literally follow all the pertinent research in perfectionism. And there's a, there are several pages in that book where they say what became obvious to us and what really needs further study is that there are a lot of people who have this perfectionism and they never let anyone know about the underlying despair. They, 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 they are hiding it. Yeah. And, and they'll say, no one knows that I, you know, do this or that. So, um, you know, now what to do if you, if you do identify with it? I mean, certainly yes. I've, I've talked a lot about it on my podcast, the self-work podcast, uh, but you can Google perfectly hidden depression and all kinds of things will come up. Um, and I've had people who've lost their children um, reach out to me. Um, you know, I think the best thing you can do as a parent is to talk about your own vulnerability, mm. uh, the things that you struggle with or struggled with when you were your child's age or I appreciate you saying age that. appropriate, because, because, you know, you can look for the signs of depression in your children, mm -hmm. but again, often these children are not, I mean, the people, the, the, the kids that, that I'm talking about aren't going to look depressed. Yes. Um, and so, but if you have, if you have um, modeled for them that, you know, it's all right to talk about struggle. It's all right to be afraid of being rejected. It's okay to be, um, to feel vulnerable and exposed, you know, that that is part of being human. And, um, and, and yet when you walk through those feelings, you learn something about yourself and you, um, it, it's, it's an experience that isn't, it's, people think that that's a shameful thing. I should never let anyone see me as being weak or, or not know what to do. Um, and there, there I'm, you know, there's so many very 
tangible things in, in the podcast, I go, what can you do about it? And there's some things that I, and I, there's a chapter in the book called change um, where I'm suggesting, okay, so let's say you struggle with, you know, you've got to always look in control. So what if you were the, you were at work and, and you were at a committee meeting. And so the committee meeting ends and instead of going, all right, well, I'll get back with y'all. I'll summarize everything we've done today and I'll get back with you where I think it's a good direction. Instead of saying that, what if you said, you know, there've been some, a a lot of great ideas. Um, Does anyone have anything else to add? Or I'm not real sure which direction to go. What do y'all think would be, uh, you know, in any ideas about that, where you don't have to look like you're the one who's got it all together. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I think um, I really like I really like what you were saying about parents being vulnerable and sort of modeling, you know, ways, because I think what's important for parents to realize is that your children are performing in a way so that they don't want to upset you, raise alarm bells or be considered as problems. Right. So if you, you know, if you model it in a way that, hey, it's not, you're not a problem. And I want, I would want you to be able to feel safe enough to mm-hmm. come to me and to talk to me. I really True appreciate, wisdom. yeah. <laughs> right, right. And you yeah. don't always have to be at your best. Um, and, in you know, it's, I still love you anyway. So I think, you know, just making it uh, safe, yeah. so to speak. I and and, and 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 normal normalize i think yeah normalize it i think is yeah. the way to do because i think that's the other thing if you, people hear depression and they're like whoa that's not normal <laughs> but it is yes it is so i appreciate you saying that and i i appreciate all the the wonderful insights i think um and it's so great to have this conversation with you thank but, you we are at the end. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Rutherford, um, tell us how we can, you know, the listeners, if, if what you're saying resonates with people, which I'm sure it will, tell us um, how we can find you. And, you know, if you've got some things that you're working on that we can sort of support you with um, and that kind of stuff. I appreciate that. Well, the book is out. It's on Amazon and um, it's on, you know, you can find it at Barnes and Noble. You can find it in indie books. You can find it a lot of places. And it does have 60 exercises to help guide you. Now, I'm, I say about 47 times in the book, if you have severe trauma in your childhood, then you need to work with a trauma therapist. So, you know, just a self-help book is not probably the best for you, but at least you can begin. Um, my mm-hmm. website is drmargaretrutherford.com, uh, which is a very creative name. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, my email is askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. I'd be more than willing to answer questions. Um, the podcast is a self-work podcast. What I've got going on now is I'm really trying to, I'm, I'm doing courses for clinicians through CEU. Um, and I'm being asked to do coursework for one of the most exciting things I'm working on right now is that um, I've been asked to speak at the University of Florence in Italy. And so, yeah, and the book has been translated into eight different languages. Um, Yeah, so (laughs) we aren't the only people who are struggling with this, um, English speaking folks. Um, So I'm, I'm, I can, I'm available to speak. I'm available to come talk to your group. I'm available to, uh, you know, do anything and everything I can to get this message out. I love that. And thank you so much for sharing that. That's so amazing. Thank you, Natalie. I so appreciate your, yeah. your <laughs> thank you. And, you know, I, I, I recently, it's, it's interesting that you and I are having this talk because I recently, um, I did a graduation keynote, um, over the past month and I talked about high functioning overachievers Mm -hmm. and I use the acronym PERFECT in my speech Mm -hmm. to describe high functioning overachievers and some of the struggles (laughs) 
So it coincides perfectly with what was in this book. And, Where did you and speak? I spoke at Alliant International University. Um, they had um, the, the uh, they, so they didn't have commencement during COVID. Mm -hmm. So they had class of 2020, 2021, and 2022. So it was wow. their law school, their psychology school, and I feel like their speech therapy school. And I feel like there was a couple other that I'm a couple other schools in there that I'm missing. But it was a huge commencement ceremony and so wow. yeah that uh, congrats yes. to you <laughs> Thank i'm you. glad for them what a great yeah. message <laughs> yeah so it's it's so interesting that this kind of coincides with that um but yeah thank you for that but um i everything that you said really resonates um i do think it's something that that, that needs to be talked about more so i appreciate you coming to talk course, about that and i i love the, the work that you're doing and keep, i'm excited to see more work that you're doing. So thank, thank you. you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I hope that you enjoyed um, what Dr. Margaret Rutherford had to say. You know, this episode, again, resonated with me very deeply, and I hope that it resonates with you all very deeply. And, you know, I while this podcast is um, the core foundation of it is narcissism and narcissistic abuse. I think it's important to remember that oftentimes when people are going through abusive relationships or if you grew up in an abusive household, um, you will more than likely experience a lot of challenges um, and go hopefully um, encounter a lot of, um, but a lot of good things also. And, um, you know, but some of the unique challenges that you experience is are, you know, this is why I do the episodes like this, because although abuse may be um, at the core of the issue, you know, symptoms manifest in this way, um, in the signs of uh, depression, anxiety, PTSD, um, that, that may get uh, dismissed, minimized, or overlooked. Uh, because we're, we may be focusing on the trauma instead, if that if that makes sense. So hopefully um, this episode resonated with you. And I really appreciate all of the wonderful gems that Dr. Margaret uh, mentioned. And be sure to go pick up that book of hers. It's wonderful. Um, I have a link in the show notes uh, through my Amazon store. So um, love to hear what your thoughts are about this up episode and whether or not uh, what Dr. Margaret had to say resonated with you. And it's, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk with folks um, who have some skin in the game, who've written about this and, and can talk about it from the different ways um, in which they, it shows up in their clients. Because, you know, oftentimes as Dr. Margaret shared, it's not so easy to see because those symptoms can manifest as something else. And we can make a mistake in diagnosing some, some someone with something else um, as well intentioned as we are. It doesn't look like your classic textbook example of what we know to be depression. So I appreciate her um, sort of doing that in talking about her years as a therapist, as an author, and as her own challenges as well. So thank you, Dr. Rutherford, for doing that. And as always, guys, I appreciate you hanging out with us, um, listening to this chat, and I hope to see you guys here next time. Thank you so much. Take care of yourselves and be well. Check out the sneak preview of next week's episode. I think what's happening there, and, and I'm not sure how you feel about this, but is that they innately know something's wrong. Oh, of they course. absolutely are feeling like something is not right here. They just do not know that it's abuse. And with um, not you specifically, but many therapists that they might go to, they might not identify the abuse absolutely. to them, right? And so I'm so grateful that as a therapist, you can recognize that because that's awesome. And then, so because it, the, they might go in for like couple therapy, for yes. example, and yes. the, the therapist might say, okay, well, you just have a communication issue. He's got these needs that aren't being met and you have these needs and let's try and get the needs met. 
And that is just the worst case scenario when someone is being abusive because they can use the things that, that they've learned Absolutely. in that session to weaponize them and, yep. and harm the victim even more. 